pushing buttons and pulling triggers. This is Gun Funny. Welcome to Gun Funny episode 161. Today I'm going to chat with Dimitri McRollis from Primary Arms, discuss the upcoming Supreme Court nomination, highlight the new SIG exchange kit for the P365, and talk about a flight to nowhere. I'm your host, Ava Flanell, and Dimitri, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing okay, but right outside my studio, they're cutting down trees. And of course, I brought Tickles with me, so I'm just going to apologize in advance if she starts barking. It's because of all the tree cutting, which is actually pretty loud, so hopefully it doesn't come over the audio. Gotcha. All right, so before we get into it, talk about Manicore Arms real quick. If you guys have the IWI TS-12 shotgun, Manicore Arms just came out within, I think, the last month, a charging handle for it. So it sticks out about one fourth of an inch and has a half inch diameter size handle, which it's knurled for a good grip. It prevents racking your knuckles on the receiver. And just like the OEM handle, the charging handle works on both the right and the left side. It's on sale right now for $38.95, but you're not going to pay that because you're going to use the code GUNFUNNY15 and that gets you 15% off. And that is at manicorearms.com. Learn the things you never knew on Deconstructing the Industry. Dimitri, before we get started and talk about primary arms, I want to know a little bit about you. So what got you started in the gun industry? Well, I mean, I've always been into guns and buying different products and so on. And uh, I developed a reticle that... I started approaching different companies with and ended up going with primary arms. So that's that's kind of how I got into the industry and got started with everything. I met with uh, Marshall, our CEO over at Primary Arms. And, uh, you know, we decided to move forward on the ACSS line of, of reticles. Wow, that's interesting. So what was the whole reasoning for designing this specific reticle? Uh, it was more to meet my needs. I, I didn't, I felt like uh, there was nothing really out there that, met my needs. A lot of the bullet drop compensators were way off. None of the reticles provided the wind holds, ranging leads, and everything that I wanted in there. Um, Also, there was a a big operational study done with the Marine Corps and the Army where I I interviewed a lot of guys and, and started to piece together exactly what they needed as far as the shots made. Um, Following uh, several sniper competitions, we found out that the number one reason shots were missed further out was improper range estimation. Uh, The second reason was wind. So those two uh, uh, components had to be incorporated into the reticle. So the attributes of the ACSS are designed to increase hit ratio in those conditions. So it, it was more of just solving the issues that, you know, combative type shooters have. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it all started. And what were you doing previously for a job? Uh, Well, I used to be really into uh, mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. I started uh, back in the early 90s um, when uh, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu had become very popular and got into kickboxing and wrestling and Muay Thai and all that stuff and and kind of blending it together. So I had a couple of schools. Uh, They weren't very successful back then because it wasn't as popular as it is now. So I owned a a marketing company and got into marketing for a while. I owned a couple of restaurants, that kind of thing. But mainly martial arts was kind of my, you know, my passion. And and that kind of transitioned over into the gun world, into the reticles as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the philosophy of keep what works and just get rid of the rest. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, trim the fat. Yeah, definitely. There is reportedly a story of you as a kid with a pellet gun and a bird. Oh, Can you elaborate yeah. on that? Yeah. So I'm in the um, northern part of Greece uh, visiting my grandmother out there. And I um, believe I'm in like in the second grade or third grade or something like that. And uh, a friend of mine had one of those pellet guns that you crack open and put a pellet in. It wasn't a BB gun. It was like one of those pellet guns. Mm-hmm. And uh, he lent it to me and I was just just fascinated by this thing it's just like it's all i did is just shoot stuff and uh one day i saw this little sparrow land 
and I shot it and a bunch of, you know, it, it dropped dead. And my grandma saw it and she just lost it. She was like, you know, you don't kill stuff that you're not going to eat. So she grabbed me and the bird and, uh, you know, made a little chicken nugget out of it. She fried it with garlic and olive oil and oregano. It was really, really good. I, I remember as a kid thinking, wow, this thing tastes amazing. Wow. So that's the story there. So she basically took a bird and I'm assuming she plucked feathers and prepared it or unless she had you pluck out the feathers. But I mean, that's kind of going to the extreme. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you shouldn't kill stuff. For, I, I agree. I mean, people can do whatever they want, but yeah. I, I don't think killing stuff just for the hell of it is a good thing. Yeah. I mean, no, I think that that was a really great lesson that she taught you. Mm-hmm. Pretty funny. You spent 20 years doing mixed martial arts. What's the highest that you achieved as far as ranking goes? Well, it, you know, in, in jiu-jitsu, I ended up with a black belt under... Um, Joe Winters, but that that doesn't really. When it comes to mixed martial arts, the belts go out the window. It's it's a different. Uh, well, and it depends on art. what kind of martial art, right? It's like taekwondo, and all of it's different. Yeah, well, I mean, you have a lot of belts and a lot of rankings in in sport type systems, which mm-hmm. don't have striking involved. And then when when you get into real fighting, and you're you're talking about, let's say, jujitsu on the ground. And you start adding elbows and punches and, and knees and elbows and all that stuff into it. A lot of the stuff that they teach and a lot of the stuff that they show guys is more designed for sport, mm-hmm. not, not actual fighting. So um, I think the, the, the thing for me, it was more of uh, training some, you know, really top guys, uh, being around the, the Sabres when they had a team and Antonio McKee and Tracy Hess and Chris Brennan. and um, you know, being around Francisco Buen, just just a lot of these guys and, and watching them go up the ranks and compete, you know, on a world class level. Mm-hmm. So that, yeah. that's kind of what I what I look at is that not so much you know what I've done. Going back to primary arms, so primary arms, they liked your design, they picked it up, and then at what point did you start working there? Um. Well, I don't actually work there. I'm a contractor oh, that they okay. contract out. Yeah. So, um, oh, man, I want to say nine, ten years ago. Wow. And then since then, you've designed a bunch of different reticles. Yeah, I, I, I've done. I don't even know. I need. I need to sit down and count them. It's got to be forty or fifty some reticles at this point. Wow. And which ones would you say you're most known for? Uh, probably the standard ACSS because it it ended up in the TA31 uh, ACOG by Trijicon. So that kind of uh, turned a lot of heads. Mm-hmm. You know, that Trijicon doesn't really uh, let other companies incorporate reticles into their into their optics. So that was kind of a big deal for us. Um, that and the Aurora, the Aurora has been uh, highly successful in the Army Marksmanship Unit competitions. So, yeah, I, I would say those two are, are. And what? So, I mean, this might be a stupid question, but how do you go about designing a reticle, even from creating the idea to actually making it happen? Yeah, I was telling my buddy this the other day that um, he's like, "How did you come up with this?" And I was thinking, like, well, I, I came up, you know, I came up with it by simply. Uh, solving the issues that i have so it's just all problem solving the part that i don't get how i know is the complicated math that goes on the back end and all the conversions um you know to do a reticle and do it right you need to know not only the minutes of angle but the tangent of minutes of angle of how much the the laser is kind of cut on the glass to have the proper uh dimensions for a particular fo- particular focal length and then be able to know how to check it and um so that, that that gets really complicated to know how to, you know, have the proper math for the correct range estimation, the correct ballistics to it. Mm-hmm. And it got to a point where I was looking at this stuff and I was saying, like, I don't know how I know this stuff at this point. It's almost got a life of its own. It's kind of like God downloaded it into my head somehow. Yeah. I don't know, to tell you the truth. It's just been, it's been a crazy ride. For once, when you tell your math teachers in high school, you're like, I'm never going to use this in real life. And now you're like, ah, I used it. I'm using it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can just imagine. 
Okay, so you design the reticle, and then do you make, I'm guessing, a prototype? Right. So the process is, is I designed the, uh, the reticle. We use SolidWorks. So um, it's like an AutoCAD um, file that gets sent out to the factories. Mm-hmm. They create a prototype that we get back. Well, actually, they create their file, their version of it. Um, and then we double check their numbers and then we get their prototype back. Um, and then it goes through several charts, making sure that all the all the minutes of angle are correct and all the dimensions are cut properly. And after it passes all that, then it goes to the range and we fire, oh God, just pallets and pallets of ammo to make sure that this stuff works as it should um, and confirm every single drop, confirm the wind holds, the leads, the ranging. And when it's all confirmed completely, then we give the factory the go to, you know, start manufacturing and producing it in a mass scale. Um, then when we get those, you know, a batch back, we pull ever so often out of the batch and check and make sure that the quality remains. So. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And then tell me a little bit about primary arms. How has it been working with them? Uh, it's been interesting. You know, it's, it's it, we've been together for a while now. And um, what's funny is it, it all kind of started uh, as a, as a dare. Mm-hmm. Uh, our CEO was online one day and, he was saying, well, how come, you know, because back then it was, you either had these like little cheap red dots that you fire a hundred rounds and all of a sudden they're losing zero and you're trying to yeah. figure out what the hell happened. Um, or you had these like $600, $800, you know, military grade optics. There was nothing in between. And, um, and he said, well, how come there's nothing in between? And, and some guy on there was being a smart ass and said, well, why don't you make something? So him and his uh, brother, Joe, you know, started uh, putting together the, a, a mid-level type red dot. And that's kind of how Primary Arm started was off a, a red dot. And um, it went from this little gun shop to, it, you know, it's grown into this huge operation now. I mean, it's a huge warehouse with multiple buildings and directors, and, you know, different uh, branches and so on. So mm-hmm. it, it's, it's, it's grew a lot. So yeah. it's been interesting to watch it grow like that. Yeah, no kidding. Because I just remember when you hear primary arms, you always just think optics, but they at this point sell, and I would say like every kind of gun part, other optics, first aid kits, and it's kind of becoming the one-stop shop. Right. Yeah, we carry pretty much everything. All right. I'm going to take a quick break real quick, talk about SB Tactical. Another one of the specialty braces that you should go check out is the SBA3 takedown kit if you have a Ruger 1022 charger takedown pistol. And I just actually used one of these the other day. It wasn't mine, but somebody on the range asked me if I wanted to shoot their gun. And I obviously am never going to say no to that. So I have a little bit of experience with it and it's really cool. It basically turns the charger pistol into a micro 1022 carbine that takes down to a very small package. It comes with the ultra-popular SBA3 adjustable brace. It's designed to fit up to 0.920 barrels. It includes the complete polymer chassis to replace the OEM chassis of the takedown charger, and the entire kit, including the brace buffer tube and chassis, are only $199.99. But don't forget to use the code GUNFUNNY15. That gets you 15% off that price, and that is at sb-attactical.com. Primary Arms, they do have a storefront in Texas, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been there? I haven't. From what you heard, is it fairly large? Yeah, there's actually a video on it online. If you go to like uh, Koto Boy 32, Mm -hmm. he came and visited the uh, storefront and the warehouse and so on. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm on the West Coast, so I, I, you know, see everybody mainly during SHOT Show. Mm Mm-hmm. And have you heard anything about how COVID and everything like that has affected them? Yeah. I mean, uh, in the beginning, we didn't know if they're going to close us down or what was going to happen. And then, you know, it got to a point to where you had to make an appointment to come to the storefront and that kind of thing. And so, it, it, you know, it, it affected the storefront a lot. Um, not so much the warehouse. I mean, the COVID's brought business up i don't know if it's like three five hundred percent yeah it's just been insane you know it's just 
the whole industry is buzzing right now. Yeah, I know. It really is crazy. I think if you're in the gun industry, regardless of what you're selling or doing, business has increased and it's just out of control. I know that a lot of stores are kind of struggling to keep things in stock. And then people, once guns were kind of limited, then people were like, okay, well, I'm just going to build my own. And then parts became limited. But it's weird. Whenever I buy a gun, and I think maybe I should change this and I should get more into optics, but whenever I build or buy a gun, the optics usually the last thing I think about, Mm. which is kind of dumb. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I do it the other way around. It's like the optic first and I build around it. Well, especially if you're shooting long distance, then it definitely matters. But if it's just a few hundred yards, I don't know. I guess I'm not as picky. I shot at a mile, which is the farthest that I've shot. And at that point, optics make all the difference. It's extremely important. But yeah, I need to change that up a little bit. Yeah, that's a different zip code at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we, we make different optics for different applications of fire. So if you're only shooting 200 yards, you know, where we got like, single red dots yeah have, uh, our one by six kiss reticle which is like a chevron it's an lpbo one by six and the cool thing with that is that it's etched so if the battery dies it doesn't matter you're still going to have a, a bold reticle to use oh nice yeah that's definitely <laughs> convenient i talked to you a little bit yesterday and you mentioned that you have lead poisoning and yeah. i want to highlight that because i don't think i've ever met anybody who actually had lead poisoning And the way that you got it is interesting. I know that the indoor range that I use, all the employees have to get tested once a month for lead poisoning because they're just cleaning up the range and stuff like that. But can you just explain how you got it? Uh, Well, I mean, I've been shooting almost my whole life. I mean, the last last 20 years has been a lot of shooting. I mean, that's kind of when I really got into it. It... uh, Mainly, you know, any time you shoot, there's a vapor of lead that just flows all around you and you end up inhaling a lot of the stuff. It ends up mm-hmm. on your face, on your shirt. So I have a, a huge round count. I mean, it's got to be at least a mil. I mean, it's it's a lot of shooting, a lot of hand loading. I think a lot of it, too, was handling the uh, the steel targets because we did a lot of unknown distance. So we would drive out and set up steel and then go back, use the reticle to range it, shoot it, and then we would move them around. So not taking precautions and touching those steel plates. Those steel plates are covered in lead. So anytime you're putting your hands on them, you're, you're putting lead on your fingers. Yeah. Anytime you're spray painting them and you're smelling the spray paint, well, you're inhaling lead as well. Anytime you're stepping near the target spray painting, your, your shoes are in the same dirt that you're fragging in. So now when you take those shoes and you, you know, walk into the house and bring that dirt into the house, you're bringing lead into the house. So it's important that we take precautions. Uh, there's D-lead wipes that you can use to wipe your hands and your face. Uh, mm-hmm. they make but that soaps. obviously doesn't really come off your clothes. You're still tracking that lead with you after you leave the range. You are, yeah. And, and what you what you have to do is wash your clothes in a different load than your, than your regular you know, your, clothes. Then your regular clothes and they make a, a de lead soap. Wow. Are you talking about like a laundry detergent, de lead detergent? Right. Interesting. Right. So, yeah, you want to wash it with that and then you want to do another uh, load uh, uh, without clothes in it. Just do another one and rinse it out to make sure you get everything out of there. That kind of seems like a lot of work and it makes me not want to shoot anymore. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a germaphobe. I usually, whenever I go to the range, Obviously, I wash my hands with d lead soap and stuff like that. But then I always wash my clothes immediately. But I typically put all of my other clothes. If I'm doing a load wash, I just put the rest of the clothes in there. But I never really thought about, I don't know. And have you ever done a load of wash and then in your dryer you find full-on cartridges, like complete? Oh, yeah. It would be like a handful of 22s and the little... Yeah, and you're like, oh, I guess I didn't realize that that was in my pocket so much for removing the lead. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, now, you know, after being sick from it, I, I always check everything. But mm-hmm. before, yeah, I'd have to like a mag's worth of uh, 22 stuck in the little lint yeah. uh, screen, you know. How did you realize that you had lead poisoning? Well, I, I started to get... um kind of like an autoimmune reaction when I ate certain things. So it would feel like 
it's really hard to describe. It was just like neurological issues and just, you just, I felt like I was going to pass out. It was just horrible. And, and it got worse and worse and worse. And, um, you know, I was, I, I didn't know what was going on. And, and when I would eat, it would feel like my ears would swell up because it, it, it creates like inflammation in your brain and your inner ears and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I went to a bunch of doctors and kind of focused on the ear thing. So I thought maybe I had like um, something wrong with my ears. But um, one day I was talking to Rex from Rex Reviews. And uh, Rex goes, hey, have you ever been tested for lead? I said, no, I never even thought of that, right? Which is crazy because I'm like bathing in lead every day. Mm -hmm. So I went to the doctor and he did a blood test, which by the way, and we'll talk about that too, is that that's not the proper way to test. If you're showing up high lead on blood tests, you really need to start checking completely because you, if you're showing up on, on blood, you have a whole bunch of it in your tissue and bones. Wow. So he, he checked my blood and he said, oh, wow, you got a ton of lead in your blood. And um, he tried to chelate me. There's this medication called DMSA that you take to get the lead out. And after a while, he said, okay, well, you know, this blood test says you're good to go. Well, Doc, I feel like I'm going to die. And he's like, well, you know, I don't know. I'm like, okay. So I went to another doctor, Dr. Fowl here in uh, Las Vegas. And um, I showed him the lead tests and he literally just threw them in a folder. And I asked him, I go, well, aren't you going to look at the numbers? I mean, what are you? He's like, all blood tests are false. That's not how it works. He says, You're, the human body automatically takes the the lead out of your bloodstream and hides it into your tissue, into your bones, your muscles. So the correct way to do it. Um, also, my, my friend Tom from uh, Fifth Group, he, he had lead poisoning. He was an instructor in all the uh, shoot houses. And he told me the same thing. He goes, that's not how you test. You have to do a urine test. And it's a provocative test, meaning you take medication prior to mainly DMSA. And you urinate within a, a like six hour span and capture all that, and then they test because what what it's doing is it's pulling the lead out of your bones, your tissues, and so on. Mm-hmm. And when we did that test, I showed up in the high reds. I mean, it wow. was like off the chart. Um, so, like even a year and a half later, I'm still on the bottom of the reds. You know, not feeling good, and I still have the reactions and so on. But it's gotten a little better. So, wow. but what ends up happening? Eventually, you get it out but you don't get it out because there's still some trapped in your bones and it, and it leaks, it leaks out and then you end up having high lead again and you have to keep treating it. So it takes like decades to get it out. Gosh, that's insane. I guess I never really looked into that and realized what it could do. It's a huge issue, especially in the special forces community because these guys are shooting suppressed indoors, mm-hmm. uh, breathing and so on. Yeah. So the, their levels of lead and mercury are very high. It's it's part of the reason why the military switched to the uh, M855A1 now, which is a non-lead bullet. Mm-hmm. They're trying to get away from lead. Interesting. Yes. I wonder if we're going to look back and people are going to be like, yeah, they actually shot lead bullets. If it's going to be something, because lead used to be like in paint and stuff, and now it's unheard of. There's lawsuits. So I wonder if that's going to be pretty soon a thing of the past just to prevent this from happening. I hope so. I mean, it's, it must be cheaper to do lead than anything else. I know. So I yeah. Wow. But one thing I want to, you know, to the listeners out there, never, ever drive with your steel inside the, the truck or your car to where you're enclosed with it. Because now you're driving around and you're, that lead's going all throughout the car. You're inhaling it. And then, you know, the next day you, you take the steel out and you put your baby seat in and you're driving your baby somewhere or something. Yeah. So, be aware of that because you're just contaminating your whole car. Wow. Do you still shoot quite a bit now or did you kind of just give it up until? I shoot um, not anywhere near as much as I used to. So I do a lot of spotting and my friends do the shooting. So I'm, I'm mainly capturing the data to make sure our stuff's still working. Mm-hmm. Um, I wear a mask if I am going to shoot myself. So um that and I take full on, like I shoot, as soon as I'm done shooting, I take the lead wipes, wipe my whole face, hands down, take off my shirt, put a different shirt on, drive home, you know, wow. separate all that laundry. Yeah, I'm, I'm real cautious with it. Yeah. yeah I highly yeah. recommend that everybody gets tested for lead a proper way. It's not that much. It's like 300 bucks or something to get it, to get tested. That and 
as something as simple as like taking cilantro oil. Cilantro is a chelating agent. It, it detoxes you from lead. So hmm. if you get a bunch of cilantro and grind it all up with some garlic and you know, make a paste out of it that you put on a piece of bread or a cracker and you eat it a couple times a week, it, it will go a long way of helping you detox. Nice. Well, I'm in luck because I'm actually growing cilantro right now. <laughs> so <Cool. laughs> I'm already on on the correct road. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that with us because that is something that I think a lot of shooters overlook and I definitely overlooked it. I just thought that as long as I wash my hands, don't touch my face and change my clothes and wash them when I get home, I'm in the clear. But that's interesting. All right. Moving forward, do you have any plans that you can share with listeners, like any future products or news or anything like that? Um. Well, as far as the future products, I, I can't really talk about all the stuff, but I can talk about some of the stuff that we've leaked out. Okay. Um, there's a, a pistol site that we're doing it's a joint effort between us and halo sun and um originally we named it uh, acss cyclops hg but it caused a bit of confusion because we have a cyclops prism site so now we renamed it to acss vulcan and um it's a pistol site that has a chevron instead of a dot Mm -hmm. but also has a giant circle around it that you don't see through the optic unless you're misaligned. So uh, I don't know if you've ever used a pistol sight where you pick it up and you're like, okay, where the hell is the dot? Mm-hmm. You have to figure out where you're at. Well, with this thing, anytime that the Chevron is out of the field of view, you see an edge of a circle and that circle guides you back into the center. So now when you center it back and you put the Chevron dead center, you don't see the circle anymore. So it acts like a guide to help you center, um, hmm. especially under like nods when you're, you know, under night vision, you yeah. can't really see your hands, your irons and stuff. So it really helps there. Um, and, uh, you know, we sent out samples across the industry to some of the, you know, uh, like Mr. Guns and Gear and Carl from uh, Tactical Rifleman and Coda Boy, Tim from Military Arms Channel. And so they've all been shooting it, testing it. And they're all saying, you know, this thing is revolutionary. Hmm. Wow, that's so, really cool. And I've noticed now pistol red dots is all the hype. Even local law enforcement, they're now carrying guns that have red dots on them. And even as an instructor, sometimes there's people that their eyesight is not working in their favor or they're both nearsighted and farsighted. And at that point, I always recommend a red dot just because it's so much easier for them to to line up their gun properly. So, yeah, I'm excited to see that. I haven't even heard of that. I'm going to have to actually go and look at their videos. Did they already put out videos or are they just giving you guys feedback right now? Um, so their videos were put on hold because, um, Trigicon ended up suing Halo Sun. Oh, Because yeah. of the, uh, um, one of the, the button placements on the site and so on. So that kind of affected us because we couldn't release it. So now, uh, Halo Sun is redesigning it and putting the buttons in a different location and so on. Wow. But we told the guys, Hey, you know, have fun with it, but please don't put it out in its current configuration because that's not how it's going to retail. So mm-hmm. interesting, but I'll send you a, a video that, you know, we did internally and you can kind of see how the thing works. Okay, great. So. All right. Well, if you guys want to check out primary arms, you can do so at primaryarms.com. And now moving forward, IWI. Well, if you've been wanting to get out and do something fun, which let's face it, most of us do, and you're also looking to up your training, IWI is hosting classes near Eagle Lake and Crescent, Texas, and they're the Tavor carbine classes, which I was told even if you don't have a carbine, they will supply one. Don't quote me on that, but that's what I've heard. And they have these classes coming up end of October, early November. I think it's a great class. It's a great opportunity to learn from experts, law enforcement, special operations, and you learn the proper use of the Tavor and the SAR style rifles. So you can check that out at their website, which is iwi.us. And don't forget, if you guys find any accessories that you like, you can use the code GUNFUNNY15 and that gets you 15% off. Okay, so as far as the political AF segment, I am actually going to record that later on during this week, because I think that at this point, they're going to 
have some nominees for the Supreme Court. So I will discuss that later on. Politics. What is going on in the world today? It's political AF. Here we are one day later after President Trump nominates Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. And I wanted to wait to see who he was going to nominate before putting out this show. Otherwise, that information would be outdated. So here helping me today is Jon Snow. He is king of the Patreons and a fellow Patreon, obviously. And we're just going to talk about it. So, John, do you want to start? Sure. So Amy Coney Barrett, she became a favorite of a lot of people for a potential Supreme Court pick back in 2017 when Mm -hmm. she was elevated to the Seventh Circuit Court. And at that point, basically, she caught the attention of the president and she was named as a potential successor back when Kavanaugh was nominated. But rumor was Trump wanted to keep her as a potential Ginsburg replacement because she has such a good record. And she was a professor at Notre Dame. She's a mother of seven. Two yeah. of the kids are adopted. I read that. I was like, oh, my God, how could she even? I mean, just being a mom of one, I think, is, you know, quite. The, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> quite and, the responsibility. And she's, 40, and she's only 48. <laughs> wow. So she's been quite successful in law. She's known as being a pretty strong constitutionalist, Mm -hmm. which is potentially pretty good for the Second Amendment. Absolutely. Um, How she will actually vote on some of the critical Second Amendment issues, we kind of don't really know yet. One of the things she has been on record for was in the Seventh Circuit, she had a dissenting opinion that she wrote where the decision of her Seventh Circuit court did not rule in her favor, but her dissenting opinion was that nonviolent felonies like mail fraud should not take away your gun rights, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because strictly according to constitutional law, it was very common for felons in those days that were not violent to not have their rights like voting rights or gun rights stripped from them. Mm -hmm. And so that interpretation was a very strong dissenting opinion that she wrote in that case. And that does potentially show us that she has some good Second Amendment potential. Yeah. Uh, like I said, we kind of don't really know at this point yet. Yeah. It will be interesting to see. One concerning thing, she has made some statements in the past indicating support for if somebody seems like they might be dangerous, that their gun rights could be taken away, which so red might... flag laws. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I would expect she will probably rule in favor of red flag laws. I have the same suspicion on Kavanaugh and some of the others. So I think, unfortunately, the deck is stacked against us on that. She's obviously going to be way better than anybody that Biden or Harris would nominate. Mm -hmm. Let's face it. If Biden gets in, it's Harris. Yeah. She's already said it's a Harris administration. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And I know there was a lot of people that were upset that Trump, you know, that he nominated somebody right before elections which he's still president. He still has a job to do. Yeah. And that gets us into a lot of the history of Supreme Court nominations before an election. This is not at all uncommon. It's come up 29 times in our history. So 29 different occasions. And of those 10 of those cases, the presidency was held by one party and the Senate was held by another. This was the case that we had with Merrick Garland when Obama nominated him and the Senate did not take it up because the Senate was controlled by the Republicans. And all of the other times, nine out of 10 of those times, they were all turned down Mm -hmm. when the party was different. So that's not at all different. There is no actual rule anywhere in law that says when the president puts forward a nomination that the Senate has to consider it. There's just no law there. Yeah. And it's been done time and time again throughout our history. Yeah, exactly. They just don't want to remember history. Mm -hmm. 19 separate times when a Supreme Court seat has become available in an election year, president and Senate have been controlled by the same party. Only one instance of those 19 times was the nominee rejected. And that was when Lyndon Johnson tried to elevate Abe Fortas 
who was actually already on the Supreme Court, but he tried to nominate him to chief justice. In that nomination process, there were some ethics concerns that came up. And ultimately, he ended up resigning because of those ethics concerns. But apart from that, this is nothing new. It's just they don't want any more Trump nominations. And so we've seen some truly disgusting things come out of some of the prominent liberals on the left threatening violence and riots. Oh, I know. It's insane. It's like that's the new temper tantrum. Things don't go their way. Okay, let's riot. Yeah, let's burn it all down. Mm Mm-hmm. Hearings before the Judicial Committee, they're scheduled for, what is it, October 12th, I think? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so four days of hearings are scheduled there. It'll be interesting to see what happens in there because we've got both Harris and Feinstein on that committee. Feinstein has not been doing the best job lately mm-hmm. in the, the Kavanaugh hearings, especially. She knew that some of the stuff that came up was false, and yet she proceeded with the allegations in it. Harris, of course, if she goes after a woman who is very accomplished, it could be very problematic for her as well. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. But ultimately, the way the system is set up there, they can delay that process by a week, which they're expecting to happen. So even with that week delay after the four days of hearings. It's like October 26th, I think. Yep. Yeah. So potentially a full vote by October 26th. And then we get into the issue of turncoats on the Republican side. Murkowski and Collins on the Republican side. I would be very surprised if either of those side with the Republicans simply because they were very reluctant to in the Kavanaugh hearings. And they both said that they would say no if the vote happened before the election. Mm -hmm. So Hmm. it'll be interesting to see what happens. Romney is also another one that potentially would be a turncoat. I don't trust him very much. Yeah. It's definitely going to make the election all that much more spicy. Oh, I know. So, yep, go ahead and get that popcorn ready because, yeah, it's about to get a little crazy. I was actually just telling somebody the other day, 2020 has been crazy enough. And then to make it an election year on top of this, I'm like, I just can't wait for everything to just pass. It's just, it's a lot for anybody who follows politics and current events and stuff. With everything going on, it's just a lot to take on. There's so much going on. And I don't know. I personally think it just adds to the stress of 2020, but that's life. Yep. The insanity of politics this year has been on an entirely new level. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Because every election year obviously gets a little crazy and each side gets, you know, you know, they can definitely be, I don't know what's the word. I don't want to say they can play dirty, but I mean, you can definitely see. Yeah, there you go. But I kind of feel like this year is so much different than previous years. And it's just, it's crazy out there. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for filling us in. And now I'm going to continue with the rest of the show. Thank you. Moving forward, Smith & Wesson. If you haven't already done so, you should go check out Smith & Wesson's line of MMP 15s. They have a ton of different versions, including the Sport 2 version with the Magpul MOE M-Lock carving handguard. It's a great quality AR, and it comes standard with A2 flash higher railed gas block, a bunch of other stuff, and its MSRP is $794, which is pretty affordable because figure you're probably not going to pay that MSRP. But you can check out all of the descriptions and what it comes with and all of the rest of their guns at smith-wesson.com. All right, Q&A. Q&A. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Just kidding. Visit gunfunny.com forward slash contact to submit yours. Today's question is, how easy is the Shield 380 Easy compared to the Shield 9mm Easy? I keep thinking about the 9, but wonder if the 380 might be better for my mom, who has trouble with grip strength and recoil. So I would say if they don't really have much hand strength, I would definitely recommend the 380 because the 9, even though it shoots really well, it is going to have a lot more recoil. I personally, I like both. I have both, but I would say even when I teach my classes, if it's a beginner or Somebody who just doesn't seem to have that hand strength as much, I typically will give them the 380 to use. And honestly, guys, don't forget that 380 and 9mm, they have the exact same size diameter bullet. 380 is just a little bit shorter and has less power behind it, but 
you're using it for self-defense, and most encounters are going to happen pretty closely. So I don't know how much more you're gaining from having a 9 millimeter. 380, I think, is pretty substantial for protection. So yeah, that's my two cents. Dimitri, do you have anything to add to that? Shot placement is key, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what I always tell my students, especially the ones that have 45s, for me, mag capacity and the ability to shoot it properly are much more important because everyone always thinks they're going to have that perfect stance, perfect grip. And typically, your hands are the first thing to typically get shot if you're ever in a gunfight. So now let's say you have your non-dominant hand that you have to shoot with and you're going to be in a compromising position. So you want to have control over that gun and a 45, you know, shooting it one handed is going to have quite a bit of recoil. So for me, it's just important, whatever gun you shoot best that you think you're going to hit your target with, I would use that gun. 22s, on the other hand, it's, eh. I don't know. I always try to deter people from using 22s. Obviously it's better than not having anything. The only reason why I don't like that is just because 22s are just notorious for misfires. That's really why. Right. That's what I was going to say, too. It's not so much the, I mean, not, not that it has great stopping power, but it's, it's better than nothing. But mm-hmm. mainly it's both primers don't go off half the time. I know. So. Yeah. And that's exactly what I tell my students. Sometimes you might luck out and certain guns really like certain types of ammo and you have less malfunctions. But it's really just it's not even a matter of if it's a matter of when you're going to have malfunctions if you're shooting a 22. Right. All right. Sharps bros. If you guys are wanting to build a great looking PCC, you should go check out the Jack Lower. You're able to chamber it in 9mm, 40 Smith & Wesson, 357 SIG. It's been updated with the second generation styling, which has more material milled out of the receiver, giving it kind of like a more refined look and it reduces weight. If you want to check that out, head on over to sharpsrose.com. Tacti Talk. Discussing popular guns and gear. Love it? Hate it? Find out now. SIG just released the new exchange kit for the P365. So when SIG launched their P365, after that, they released a lot of different other models, including the P365 XL. And one of the first questions that came up was if you can switch out the slides. And everyone soon learned that you can. And then the next question became, well, what if they want to convert their original P365? So SIG kind of just solved that problem. They just released a kit with everything except for the fire control group for the P365 XL. The only downside is it's $500. So I would say for another $100, you can pretty much buy a brand new gun. You could buy the XL. (laughs) But it is in stock right now on their website. And the real beauty of the design is that SIG followed the same modular drop-in ideas as the P320. So companies are already doing a lot of custom grip modules for that. Laser zippling packages, custom slides, and Cerakote packages. The P365 is definitely starting to become the new Gucci gun. First it was Glock. Then people kind of started to venture over to the P320. But the P365 is kind of making its way. So. I don't know. I like that they came out with that, that you can just buy it. I think next they should release the P365 fire control group like they did the 320 so that you can buy all these other parts. And then the fire control group is obviously the serialized section and you could just drop that in. So I'm imagining that we're going to see that with the P365, but $500, that just seems a little much, especially when it doesn't include the fire control group. Obviously, you're just like, okay, well, I'll just buy this gun instead. That's what I would do. So I think they need to come down a little bit on that price. But other than that, I'm excited for that product and kind of look forward to seeing it in person. Speaking of the P320, Polymer 80 has the PF320 PTEX, and it's designed to give you that 1911 style grip, but obviously it's compatible with all the P320 components. You guys can check that out at polymer80.com. Also, don't forget to use the code GUNFUNNY for 15% off. All right, now time for the AF segment. Stupid, funny, cool, interesting, awesome, as... Never mind. 
AF. Recently, Australian airline Qantas announced that they are doing a seven-hour scenic flight to nowhere, which will take off and land at the same airport, which is in Sydney, I believe. It takes off October 10th, and they return the same day. Basically, the tickets for this sold out within minutes. There was 134 seats available. Prices ranged from $575 to $2,765. And at first, when I read this, I was like, who the hell wants to stay on a plane for seven hours? And who would pay for this? And you're not going anywhere. Typically, I don't really travel that much abroad just because I always dread the flight. Which, I mean, if you've been to Greece and stuff, so you probably understand long flights, they suck, right? Oh, yeah. So, suck is an understatement. Yeah, I know, right? Typically, I'm just like, give me an Ambien, wake me up when we get there. But this flight is actually, it's not going as high up. So it's traveling fairly low so that it's very scenic. And you can see views over places like the Great Barrier Reef. So when they put it in that perspective, then I guess it sounds kind of cool, even though I still think seven hours is sort of long. And they're going to be traveling in the Boeing 787, which is normally used for long distance international travel. And yeah, I think Asia try to do something similar because I think people want to fly and they want to get out and about, but there's a lot of restrictions with the borders. So they pretty much have to travel within their country. And now it's time for iTunes review. So guys, if you haven't left an iTunes review, please do so. It just helps me out a lot. And you have the opportunity to win a cool prize. First review is Valet Manager. Love the content. Five stars. 1010 would recommend. The content is great. And so far, all of the guests really add a lot of value, insight into the gun world and current events. Keep up the great work. And I hope you have some insight into the incident with Kyle Rittenhouse. Keep up the great job. I thought I talked about Kyle Rittenhouse. Maybe I didn't. Second is Monster Man 03. Yes. Five stars. Your show is awesome. Love the gun knowledge and the dry humor. Literally get looks when I bust out laughing at some of the comments you make. And I'm glad that most of the guests you have on actually know. But anyways, thanks for the content and keep up the awesome work. Oh, and stay strapped or get clapped. All right. So, Dimitri, I want you to pick one of those two reviewers to win a prize pack. So would you say the first or the second? Let's go with the first. All right. Val Manager, contact me and I'm going to send you out a prize pack. And now it's time to wrap up. So guys, you can find me at gunfunny.com. There's links to everything. If you want to support the show, you enjoy it, consider becoming a Patreon. You could do so at patreon.com forward slash gunfunny. Loan Deadline gives away a $300 gift certificate to a lucky Patreon each month. And I want to thank the $25 patrons, and that is Corbin Bonafide, Iraq Veteran 8888, Ryan Morrison, Elliot and Mike Pappas, Joe Lyons, Justin Paulson, Jason Anderson, Joshua Hamp, Sportsman's Guide, Daniel Treadwell, Star Wars 77, and Ralph Anthony. Man, that list is definitely growing. King of the Patreon is still Jon Snow. He wants me to say fear of spiders is called arachnophobia. Fear of tight spaces is called claustrophobia, and fear of operator tickles is just plain common sense. <laughs> and Dimitri, I just wanted to thank you once again. Is there a way that if anybody has questions for you, they're able to contact you, or should they just contact Primary Arms? Um, they can reach out to me on um, social media. I'm on our Instagram a lot, which is uh, Primary Arms. Okay. Uh, it will be a yellow tab under Primary Arms Optics, but Primary Arms is the the username. Uh, they can email me, Dimitri, at primaryarms.com. Um, and if they reach out to two Primary Arms, they will probably forward whatever mm-hmm. question that's directed to me. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, thank you again for spending the afternoon with me. And on that note, we are out of here. Thanks for having me. Want to send feedback? Tell us about a company or anything else. Go to gunfunny.com forward slash contact. <laughs>